and really an extraordinary set of presentations of a very wide range of people who are very learned and to try and uh, step back and get a little perspective. So I'm joined up here by Ted Geyer, who's the Vice President and Director of the Economic Studies Program here at Brookings, of which Hutchin Center is a part. David Yoakum, who my, uh, Maya Shankar mentioned earlier, who's uh, with the uh, General Services Administration, has been working closely with the Behavioral Sciences team in the White House. And Vern Gowry, uh, who's uh, an economist at the World Bank and has been working on this. And Vern, I, I think I'd like to start with you. Pretty much, except for one question about how we're going to psych out the Russians with sanctions <laughs> uh, using the insights of George Lowenstein, um, uh, has been very domestic. And most of the conversation I've heard about using behavioral insights has involved either the UK or the US, developed countries. Um, to what extent are we seeing this penetrate emerging markets and developing countries? And to what extent do you think there's potential there for the insights of behavioral economics to improve outcomes there? It's becoming a, a worldwide phenomenon. Um, our 2015 World Development Report focused on the use of behavioral economics, social psychology, and related fields in the development sphere. We got a lot of interest from a number of countries. Um, at the World Bank, now we're setting up our own little group to focus on this. Uh, when I was in London, I called it our own behavioral insights team. In Washington, I'll call it our own SBST. Um, we hope to use the insights in World Bank projects, but also to support direct requests from countries. And mm -hmm. to, I'll quickly give you an example of some Please. of the things that, that are emerging. Um, the government of India is about to undertake a major campaign on sanitation. Um, open defecation is a big problem throughout South Asia um, related to very high malnutrition rates. So you build lots of latrines, but building latrines is not enough. You've got to change lifelong habits. How do you do that? There's some interesting work um, that Paul Gertler and others have done that shows that when you use a community-based approach um, in which you sort of walk people around and take collective pledges, that can have a big impact. You have an 11% decline in open defecation in India and 7% and in Indonesia compared to control villages. That's one area. Air quality is a big issue throughout Asia. That involves cook stoves, uses of vehicles. How do you change behavior around that? Um, tax compliance is a huge problem throughout the world. Uh, you may have heard of the, the BIT's work in this area that's been replicated in Guatemala. There are a number of other countries that, that are interested in doing this kind of thing. I mean the lottery thing? To Pay the tax thing, or what do you mean? BIT, uh, what do you mean? Uh, they used a social norms prompt in letters to get people to pay their taxes um, earlier than they would have otherwise. They said most people, in fact, pay their taxes on time. Why aren't you? People who got that kind of letter, in fact, were more likely to pay their taxes. That's been replicated in Guatemala. But you know, in Sao Paulo, you, you know, there, there was, people use lotteries there. I, th I mean, the municipality uses lotteries there to encourage um, uh, citizens to ask vendors for receipts. Um, that has an impact, you know, say it's $400 million. Uh, other municipalities throughout the region um, are considering that. Uh, water conservation in Costa Rica, you know, using social norms to get people to conserve water. Um, so it's, we're seeing it in a lot of different places. Mm -hmm. David, uh, tell me something that either you thought you found particularly interesting from today's discussion or something that if you had been designing this program, you would have included. Well, I think it's a wonderful program, and you did an amazing job. I wouldn't change anything about <laughs> no, it. Wasn't um, fishing for that. <laughs> no, it, it's, I mean, thank you. you, as, you were saying, <laughs> as you were saying before, I mean, we've seen the breadth of different types of ideas that are applicable here, and also the breadth of the different disciplines that have something to contribute here, because this kind of overarching questions about how you can lift barriers to access to programs, once people are in programs, have them run efficiently and sort of be easy and intuitive to use, are really large questions that draw on a lot of different disciplines. And so I think one of the things that's been most exciting about this, this movement, both in the US but also globally, have been this coming together of so many people from so many different backgrounds, of so many different skill sets, joining together at conferences like this, joining together in teams, sometimes within government, sometimes outside of government, to try to collaboratively work together to solve some of the, the country and some of the world's hardest problems. So for me, that's a very inspiring and exciting sort of thing that I, I think we're just seeing the beginning of, and it's going to continue over the, the coming years. Hmm. Ted, uh, we had a few glimpses today of 
the limits of behavioral insights. Uh, Antoinette talked about them, David did as well. Uh, why don't you be the skunk of the garden party? Are we <laughs> doing too much on nudge and abandoning too quickly either the traditional economic notion that you give people incentives and they do what you want them to do or that we need to rely on rules rather than nudges? So I see what you've done here. You've put together an extraordinary day, and then you save the skunk for last. Right. <laughs> uh, well, first, let me be a very unskunk like or, uh, to start and just uh, uh, second what you said. The paper's been extraordinary. A few things that I would just highlight, and I'll get to your question in a second, that have been extraordinary about him. One is I agree with David Lapson that this is kind of just the beginning. It is extraordinary how far it's come in the last 20 years and how the profession and policy as a result has changed as a result, as a result of all these developments. But I, I think the <coughs> opportunities are more, and I think we'll see more of it. So that's not much of a criticism. Where I come in, and I was uh, very, I believe this is the right word, I, I, re I extremely enjoyed uh, Raj's presentation and actually the, and the insight team's presentations not just for kind of all the kind of uh, amazing insights that they were providing, but I also detected at least uh, somewhat of a tone of humility. So Raj talked about the positive findings of behavioral work, and in particular his work there, which is just remarkable in the social mobility, but at least drew back a little bit and said, well, we really need to think long and hard before we're designing policies to relocate people, which I agree with completely. And the insight team as well, I mean, these are... Uh, uh, somebody asked about the politics of it. I don't know if it was motivated by politics, but I thought it was a very unthreatening report for those who get worked up about these things. This is basically, there are a lot of programs out there where we're giving benefits and we really ought to figure out ways to implement them so that the beneficiaries get those benefits. And for the most part, that's what done, and I thought it was, that was quite good. Where I come in a, a little bit on the cautious side on some of these things, uh, and part of this is old economist jokes where I, I, look, I look for my keys under the, the traffic light, so my traffic light is environmental and energy regulations, and there I see a bit of a failing <coughs> or a misuse of behavioral economics in some of my writings. That didn't come out today. The, there's a little bit of a paradox in behavioral economics, and I think we saw a little bit of that today, which is the typical study kind of finds an irrationality and then prescribes a policy. And we today had irrational taxpayers and patients and investors and UI beneficiaries and lots of irrational people out there. And my kind of you know, novel claim in all this that is reflected in the stuff that I've written is, you know, regulators are people too, and we should shine the light that way too, and that there are irrational things going on by government actors. Uh, and so we need to think long, uh, as I think uh, Raj was in his cautious presentation, some of these things might be great ideas, but when it goes through the political process or the regulatory process, it turns out to be ugly, uh, or at least misused. And the work that I've done, specifically, on en uh, energy and environmental regulations <coughs> uh, kind of point to two things. One is there are instances where the, the regulatory response, not only are they not accounting for behavioral anomalies in the population, they're actually institutionalizing them. And a lot of this deals with risk and uncertainty, which in some ways was the foundings of behavioral economics was in the risk, risk uncertainty realm. Those things are still there, and I think they get institutionalized into policies and deserve scrutiny. And then secondly, on the energy mandates, this gets to your question, I think, even more specifically on energy efficiency mandates, I do tend to come from, and I will stick to, the neoclassical view of how to regulate pollutants, which is you should tax it. Uh, and the neoclassical view is when you do these mandates, the cost per carbon or pollutant reduced is quite high. But when you look at the regulations that are coming out and the analyses which are being approved by OMB of these regulations, they are kind of trumping these up as environmental regulations, but it's really a, a, a behavioral argument. And I don't think it's a very well substantiated behavioral argument. They're essentially saying people make mistakes when they buy energy efficient products. They tend to you know, sacrifice and buy inefficient products when they shouldn't. Therefore, we should mandate. And I totally agree with David and the implication, both Davids, that there are, the behavioral economics sometimes points to the implications that nudges aren't enough, that there needs to be mandates. Likewise, it should, and I think we deserve more scrutiny and kind of voices in this direction point to situations where there are mandates there that shouldn't be. Mm -hmm. And that's one instance where I think that's mm -hmm. the case. So I was struck by a couple of things. These are small observations, not big ones. Uh, one is that there's the realm of the stuff that's kind of non-controversial and obvious. I mean, if you can make someone right at the top of the form, I swear these things are true, 
and they are more truthful, well, a kind of end of conversation. We should just, every government form should have that in the top. We should go on to think about something more interesting. Um, as people pointed out, they're the most difficult things are the ones where we don't really know what people want to do or what we want them to do, and that's where it can get dangerous because you can get a mindset that you want to push people in some direction. Could, could I just jump in there? Yeah. Some of these are political lit or ideological litmus tests. Right. So I'll give you one, a great study by Raj and our former colleague Adam Looney and Corey Croft, which is on tax salience. We talked a little bit about tax salience now. Right. It's a great study that basically says when, people are, when a tax is not salient, when people are unaware about it, they don't respond in the same way. They don't pull back on consumption as much. So kind of one of the implications of that finding, which is sort of in their model, is you know what, if you disguise a tax so that people don't really know they're paying the tax, yeah, they get harmed. But you know, the whole notion of inefficiencies and in taxes is dead weight loss, which is when people basically reduce consumption. So in effect, what, there's, what the model is implying is the consumer gets harmed, the taxpayer gets harmed by not knowing they're getting a tax, but we make up for it by getting more tax revenue. So the gains in tax revenue dominate the losses to the consumer. Is that an efficient policy that we should start? I mean, the, not surprisingly, the behavioral unit didn't start saying, promoting, hey, we should really like, you know, make I these taxes, taxes less salient. <laughs> Wouldn't that be wonderful? That's but that's an project. example of the controversy. And to me, that is like a political litmus test. So Amy Finkelstein has a great study on Easy Pass that when you went from having to pay the toll at the toll booth to driving right through with your pass, people became totally inured to the tax and the taxes went up. Right. Is that good or bad? Is, exactly. Is, is tough. So, the two other things quickly. One is um, the a, a, a capacity of using administrative data to do interesting experiments or to un understand what people are doing is just absolutely mind-boggling. Uh, Naomi said at one point when she was asked, could she do regional variation? She said, well, I only have a million observations. So <laughs> sitting next to Raj says, okay, we've made projects. We've made progress. When someone says, I only have a million observations. And the third one is that uh, I'm pretty much convinced that most people, Hank Aaron referred, don't really understand insurance. Uh, I mean, I know in my own household, the idea that you're going to have a big deductible because we could actually afford to self-insure is something my wife, who's a lawyer, has never been able to really grasp. She somehow thinks that I'm doing something wrong, and I can't seem to get through to her. <laughs> so uh, I, I think that, I, and I thought it was interesting uh, when the 48, that grid that uh, Sarab put up, that like you know people are overwhelmed with these insurance choices, and that may be a special category for that. I have a lot of questions, but. You've all been very patient, so I want Michael. Uh, yeah, and you're allowed to ask anybody in the room a question. They don't actually have to answer, but you're allowed to ask. <laughs> yeah. um, so this is Mike Falkenheim. I'll, like Peter Orgazag, I'll declare my affiliation as Brookings, although I'm permanently somewhere else. Um, I guess my comment um, on the U.S. domestic versus development, um, I have to report I had a sense of deja vu when I was looking at the maps that Raj Chetty put up, because... In 1962, there was a book called The Fusion of Innovations that was published, and they showed crop rotation and those kinds of innovations spread out um, among agriculture in Europe. And I thought that was used. I'm looking at our friend from the World Bank. Was, uh, I thought that was used in development policy sort of over and over again. And, and I was just wondering if we're just sort of rediscovering actually something that um, in international development policy has sort of been kind of part and parcel of what you do all the time, which is that, you know, um, maybe because paternalism kind of is more of a, a natural thing when we're dealing with uh, foreign uh, populations in developing countries that, you know, there's always been this focus on how to get people to adopt whatever sort of Best new um, crop that we think is going to be healthier and higher yielding. Um, it's always been a major concern in that field. And so whether we don't kind of have it reversed in thinking it's starting here and going out to the developing world. And people do ask the question, what's new about this, right? People are motivated by social incentives. They're not fully rational. I mean, we sort of, in some sense, people know that, right? I mean, in the development sphere, people have been using microfinance uh, for a long time in which, you know, the peer pressure to repay loans is quite powerful. And it's a pretty much a standard tool. I think what's new is that there's now uh, a psychological foundation for some of these things, which leads you in certain Directions. I mean, the Kahneman Tversky kind of world sort of, you know, opens up certain avenues to, to you know, to work. Um, what what is also new is um, the focus on experimentation. 
mean, I think we didn't have that before. That, you know, I think David mentioned the A-B testing, RCTs. Development economists are very big on this. We've been doing this for, you know, for quite some time now. Um, so is it new? Um, I think parts of it are. You know, I think the sort of the lottery, I mean, certain kinds of these things I think are new. Um, I think it's all, the pervasiveness, I think, you know, understanding that it's pervasive, I think is quite powerful, including for policymakers themselves. You know, I very much agree with that. You know, in our report, we did a study of World Bank staff and found that you know, we ourselves are full of these biases. We replicate a lot of the kahneman tversky biases. Um, uh, so we need to think about that and be aware of that and de-bias ourselves. That's relatively new, I think. I mean, I don't think we've been thinking about how to, how to approach that problem. Um, and then the other piece uh, is new is, um, is the scarcity material, right? I mean, that's not something we focused on in the past, the idea that when you're poor, you're bandwidth constrained and you might not be thinking long term. And so what we need to do is to support key decision points. Um, that's not something that we've been doing in the past in development anyway. Uh, David, I know that half the people on the OSTP team have GSA email addresses, and that's just because of the way we staff the White House. But it, is it really the case that the General Services Administration is kind of wholesale embracing this approach to influencing the way government employees do their business and the way that you provide services? Or is, do we just hear from the six people who are interested in it? No, so the <laughs> social and behavioral sciences team has representation from 15 major departments and agencies and five executive offices in, within the EOP. And so it's a, it's a cross-agency movement by design and in terms of the people that are contributing to the work on a day-by-day mm -hmm. -day basis. I mean, it is the case that, you know, we have a, a smaller subset of folks that are really dedicated to this on a kind of a, a full-time day-to-day basis. But if you look at the projects that are reported in the report and you go through the abstracts, I mean, these are things that are developed very collaboratively and organically with the agency partners who bring so much to table in terms of the expertise and familiarity, familiarity they have with the program, things they've tried in the past, the sort of context that they're working in presently. You know, what is it going to take to have that great idea that's maybe been discovered in the academic literature and put it into a real world government context? You know, that's a, it's a bit of its own meat mm -hmm. grinder and you want to try to make it survive that grind. And so it's, you know, this kind of stuff wouldn't be happening if there wasn't a true uh, sort of appetite and appreciation for it across, across government. And that's, I think it's reflected in the, the constitution of the team and in the sort of projects you see in the report. Yeah, turn it. Can you use the mic? Um, can, can you use the microphone? Oh, you have to push the button. We need a, <laughs> so we're going to design button. We're going to design mics that have a built-in nudge. That'll be the yeah, project. Yeah, indeed. I'm just slow to Take learn. 47 economists to divine it, but. Uh -huh. Yeah. And it's probably a question for David, but uh, and maybe for Warren. But how much is your work going forward? Also. Um, engage the private sector or the inter you know the interface between public and private because obviously a lot of um, government policies are being um, implemented via the private sector whether it's you know contractors interfacing with the government or you know uh, 401k plan design you know um, by private players and do you have the possibility say to engage them maybe to even give them safe harbors for certain type of type of experiments um, where you would like them to test certain type of nudges or certain type of improvements in the design um, of how policies get implemented um, we were getting started. Um, possibilities along that line include mobile money. Um, building in consumer protections is crucial for mobile money because when it's less tangible and people just spend very fast. So how can we do that? We have some conversations there. Um, matching grants for small and medium enterprises. A lot of governments do this kind of thing, and, but the take-up rates are very low. You know, how can we make them more salient? How can we think about timing to make them more effective? Um, uh, those are the two that come to mind. Uh, um, road safety is another area that, in which we'll be working and working with the private sector as they did, you know, do the design of roads is something that we've had in initial conversations about. Um, but there's really... Uh, the reason why we can't do that, you know, as you know, we have a private sector on IFC that works with, the private, with uh, private companies. 
Yeah, I mean, our, our focus is on those places where the government is interacting with individuals or firms. And the government, it's pretty big. It does a lot of things. Once we solve, I guess, all of those issues, then maybe we can, you know, ask me, ask me in a couple of years about that. Well, but I think that the, the whole history of 401ks is a question of finding ways to do things and then making it possible for employers to do them, you know, with safe harbors or in sometimes tax incentives or uh, various kinds of uh, offering these programs that the government does more of the heavy lifting for small employers and stuff. Okay. Yeah, I have a question. You have to use the mic too, Louise, just because you're in the front row. I have the button. Um, as, so when I, when I was listening to Antoinette talk about the financial advisors, you mentioned there are a lot of health implications, and I was thinking in terms of incentives between physicians and patients, uh, it just seemed perfect, right? So, you know, p why do people get back surgery? Well, you're gonna go want to go to a doctor who says, I'm going to fix you. I'm gonna do this stuff and you're gonna feel much better. And you don't really want a doctor who says, well, the evidence is I can't do anything for you. So I'm wondering um, how important is it to move away from fee-for-service and to change the, to align the incentives of providers and patients and, uh, and just like what we know about that? Well, it, it's actually a really challenging problem because there's, there's no payment system that's incentive neutral. And you, we worry about over-provision on the one hand with fee-for-service, under-provision with capitated type rates. So the example of the patient who has back pain who really wants, uh, ideally they want their back pain fixed. It may be that the medical evidence uh, suggests that doing nothing for a period of time is on balance better for you than having a heroic operation up front. And so ideally the back surgeon would, would say the evidence says this is the best path forward. They would not be influenced by uh, whether they'd make more money one path or another. But in, in practice it's, you know, it's very hard um, to do that because every single payment system has Problems and so what what's emerged is efforts to create these hybrids that bring in elements. You know, we're sort of correcting one problem with another solution, and, and you know I, I think as we move away from fee for service, the big worry a lot of people appropriately have is let's say you put everybody on uh, a capitated rate, then you have a lot of doctors who will have very large panels of patients, uh, and there will be risks that. You know, you might need the surgery in this case, and you know, it's uh, even if it's a somewhat urgent case. Maybe if it's 5 p.m. on a Friday, it doesn't get done uh, as quickly as it would have. And there are ways there are ways to try to handle that by thinking about specialists and carve outs. Uh, and if you had really good gatekeepers who are well informed decision makers who are good agents for the patient, maybe they could broker that, and then you could still pay specialist fee for service. But it, it's it's a tricky problem there where there's not really a simple solution. Peter, it was mentioned earlier. Um, Peter, a, introduce yourself. Oh yeah, Peter Olson um, here at Hutchins. It was mentioned earlier within Brookings. It was mentioned that advertisers and marketers have had a lot of these insights before, and and they use them um, very effectively. I want to know more about. Are, is there an active relationship between behavioral economists who are studying in a rigorous way, and it's quantitative, and like people who work at marketing firms and, and advertisers out there? Because it seems like frequently there'll be some an insight that'll be there's a, a real contribution made by behavioral econ as it formalizes it and gives it um, enough respectability to be adopted by the government in a, in a major way. Um, but that there are a lot of uh, a lot of these insights that in some form have been had by advertisers who have a commercial with you know nice music playing and a cat and something that makes gets you to want to to do to do something so I was yes yeah, so I'm curious I guess I'll ask a directed um, I uh, professor Lapson wouldn't know this because it was a class of 100 people but I took his micro his macro econ class <laughs> um, several years back and so I'll Good direct job, it to, to, to professor uh, Lapson what his thoughts are and <laughs> I forgot that <laughs> So I've actually tried to reach out to that community and learn deeper things from them over the years. We've had, for example, advertisers coming to some of our 
classes and giving guest lectures and I've had a chance to kind of sit with them and drill them on what they do. I've actually been struck at how much they rely on empirically free intuition, or sorry, intuitions about <laughs> what works. And I say, well, how do you know it works? Have you ever done an A-B test? Have you ever tried to measure outcomes in a systematic way? And at least the people I've spoken to all say no. Um, now, that said, there are exceptions. So there are catalog companies that do lots of A-B testing. Um, and they're you know, figuring out placement on the page, fonts, colors, et cetera. So there's a lot of that going on, but it's sort of um, lowbrow A-B testing. It's not conceptual, like something like loss aversion. It's more, you know, we tried these five different fonts and this one worked best, or we, we tried these six different ways of placing the photograph and you know, this, the, this smiley face was the best one. So they don't have a lot that interests me, at least, because it's more kind of very detailed, seemingly um, technical stuff. Um, but I think you're right that despite my frustrations in not finding the right source in that community, um, they must have insights that we could learn from. And perhaps, um, you know, I should work harder and maybe others have figured out how to squeeze um, more from that stone. Could I just, Please, yeah. just one thing to add, it's not quite marketers, but uh, you might be familiar, Jim Manzi has a good book called Uncontrolled, <clears throat> kind of, he made Uncontrolled? It, or Uncontro un I think it's called Uncontrolled, is that right, Jim Manzi? I think so. so. I think that's anyway, his whole <clears throat> career <clears throat> was doing kind of rapid-fire RCTs in the private sector, so you got a client, I think Subway, should we do a $5 foot long, and then they kind of rapid fire across the franchises to see what the effects are. And some of that, I think for Capital One, I, I don't know the whole story, but the, the, the kind of emergence of Capital One, I think was kind of RCTs, which with a, with a marketing angle, like you can, mail the, you can mail them this or you can mail them that, and which one's gonna be more effective. So they're out there. <laughs> A little bit. Uh, I don't know that they're in academia and, or, or not, or, but it strikes me that he's one example. Yeah, I just wanted to say, um, I, think, I think that the analysis of the decision making is something that behavioral economists do very well. I think that changing behavior, though, is a different ball game. Because let's say you're trying to get people to pay your taxes. You could have them sign up front. You could send social norms. You could have people sort of, you know, peers come and talk. You know, you could you know, all kinds of things you can do, and how do you know which one is gonna be a priori, which one's most effective? I think that's still an art. We don't quite know that yet, and I think the advertising world might be worth talking to when it comes to that piece of it, as opposed to the analysis of the decision-making. Sir. I think it's on. Um, yep. Hi, I'm Mike Jones from uh, MDRC. Um, I just wanted to offer a comment. Um, and I should say, um, uh, trained as a social psychologist, used to teach, you know, intro social psychology, and you do this chapter on persuasion and talk about all the theories. And it always occurred to me, if I had to go out and apply this, I would know not what to do. <laughs> and it, the marketers have probably already figured this stuff out. But I think the promise of behavioral economics in this applied form is that it gives you a framework for understanding the why, right? So. Um, marketers might have already discovered, you know, various phenomena. They just don't necessarily put it in the bucket of, you know, risks under un or decisions under uncertainty and things like that. And so, I think this is all just a framework for bringing that to the surface. But, you know, ultimately, it seems like when your deliverable is a profit, you'll figure out what works <laughs> one way or another. Um, and so you don't have the RCT, and maybe you're capitalizing on chance here and there, but that's the ultimate outcome, right? Like, I got to sell this product. So, you know, one way or another, I'm going to figure it out. Even on Mad Men, wasn't there some, some number cruncher lady who came in at one point, the TV show Mad Men? Yeah, but, but, they, but they dismissed her. I mean, she came in, and they insisted on ignoring her. <laughs> right, right, okay. <clears throat> I knew there was some story. I knew there was a moral in there somewhere. I just didn't know what it was. Um, <laughs> Uh, Phil, do you want to talk a little bit? Oh, so Rob, do you want to say anything? Are you raising your hand? No, please, go ahead. Uh, okay, well, uh, I use the mic. 
We got a half right. hour. Everybody who asks a question doesn't use the mic, has to put a dollar in the Brookings Endowment. The, the button overwhelmed me. Uh, <laughs> so, Too many uh, choices? <laughs> Um, so I guess this question is for, for David, or perhaps more broadly. Um, so I, I'm, I'm really curious. Um, uh, uh, we just had a presidential debate a couple of days ago, and um, uh, we're a few months uh, from the election. How, um, how much attention uh, and uh, uh, interest have you guys um, invested in um, trying to uh, shape kind of the um, the or how, I guess, what is the, uh, the perception of the importance of kind of the political economy of, you know, launching um, uh, a unit um, such as this in such a partisan climate? And okay, you can answer, you give your official answer, and then I'll give what my answer is. So. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll give the answer. <laughs> He's going to sign it. While you <laughs> no, I mean, I think, again, if you look back at the examples in the report and the sort of work that we're doing, that there's really nothing partisan about it. I mean, use of the concepts and the methods from the social and behavioral sciences are something that anyone who wants to deliver on a program, whatever that program might be, whether it's something that's being advanced or endorsed by whatever the political party might be, you care about delivery. You want to do it effectively. You want to do it efficiently. You want to pay attention to how individuals are going to sort of respond to it. And that's, that's the kind of approach that we're talking about here. And so I think as we demonstrate that, and talk about the projects and be very transparent about it and look to the agencies for guidance on what they're prioritizing, the sort of program objectives that they're setting through the usual democratic government process that we have, then this is what, this is what gov good government is. And that's something that is going to be uh, appealing across all aisles. I would say that they've been extraordinarily careful and skillful to start on things that make what David just said 100% accurate, and that uh, I looked at the report before it, uh, when it came out, and I know there was some anxiety uh, in the White House that this might prove controversial, that you might get some uh, random congressman uh, who's, I, who would not be one of the people who came to Labson's class well prepared, so you would have had to make a substantial improvement in his or her intellectual capital to get something worthwhile out, um, that, that somebody would get up and demagogue this. Uh, and there is always the potential for that. And so I think if you look at the report, I think in a way some of the stuff seems almost trivial. But that's by design, because they didn't want to come in and say, we're going to, uh, we're going to do for you what the British government did. We're going to have this big nudge unit. And even Cass Sunstein was fairly, uh, I thought, careful in, in how we use this stuff. So I, I think that is uh, incredibly thoughtful in an environment where it just takes one congressman to get up and say, do you believe they're wasting money on X, Y, and Z? And the next thing you know, it's like you know a three-part series on Fox News, and Donald Trump is talking about it in the next presidential debate. God forbid. We have to listen to him again. Um, so, uh, so I think that uh, the, the, what, what's, what the answer to your question is they were very aware of that potential, and they've done an incredible job of navigating away from the most dangerous parts of the river. Well, they are behavioral experts. Yeah, well, <laughs> but as you know. Bill, <laughs> um, so I was going to ask you to talk a little bit about, uh, at, at, at the beginning of today, uh, Louise referred, and this is thanks to some an email that Phil sent me about how this all got going in Washington and the role that Brookings played. And I wonder if you just step back and give us, introduce yourself, and give us a little historical perspective about where this began and how far you think we've come in the last decade or whatever it was. Uh, my name is Philip Rubin, and I was uh, formerly the assistant director for social behavioral economics uh, sciences at OSTP, uh, helped hire Maya uh, along with Tom Khalil. Uh, and I'm currently uh, CEO Emeritus of Haskins Laboratories and at Yale University. So this uh, got started, I would, I would give most of the credit to uh, one, one individual uh, uh, who passed away this year, Richard Sussman at the National Institute on Aging. And some in the room know that he's been a big supporter, at, controversially a big supporter of behavioral economics uh, at, at the National Institutes of Health. 
and he was doing that having to do with uh, quality of life and the aging and using uh, uh, behavioral economic and other uh, behavioral principles. There was a series of three meetings that we had, as was uh, probably mentioned this morning, on May 22nd and 23rd in the year 2013, in which David Halpern from the Behavioral Impacts Team in the United Kingdom came. There was a meeting uh, at the White House, uh, and uh, David was there, and Dan Kahneman, Rich Thaler, and it was a, a, a discussion trying to set a framework for this. Then there was a meeting very similar to the program that you see now rolled out in the federal government at the gold, in the gold room at the Treasury, looking at what, what the agencies have been doing for over five years, but not, hadn't been calling it behavioral impacts. So work has been going on, you know, and some of it might appeal, appear small scale, some of it bigger. And then finally, the best meeting was the one uh, at uh, Brookings, uh, which there was the spirit of discussion, similar to some of the questions here is, is this just trivial stuff that doesn't mean anything? Is it anything that's going to scale? Uh, where's the meat in the matter? So it was good to see uh, the incredible energy of Maya Shankar and her ability to take this program. I will counter the, op usually you're not that optimistic, but the optimistic words you just had, because if you Google uh, the topic today, it's already being demagogued. Uh, and everything will, and that's a reality. You know, it's a political system we live in. People have different points of views. And you're absolutely right, though. It was uh, when programs are rolled out by the uh, government, it's important to try to, to focus on what the good work is and try. It's not that you're trying to avoid controversy. So I, I rolled out the White House uh, Neuroscience and the Brain Initiative. And so we got the same criticism you get now, Obama mind control. Hmm. Bottom line <laughs> is... I uh, guess it's a you, failure. <laughs> when, you're, when you're rolling out programs, t uh, two things. One, you have to go with what you have at the best, see if there's any there there, make the thing sustainable, and see it will grow. President will be gone, Maya will be gone, everybody in this room will be gone. But if it's something that's useful, then you try to instantiate it. In this case, they did it through the National Science and Technology Council and the SBST team. Finally, they're b building a community. They're bringing people together who haven't met each other, and then f going beyond the federal government to make it more sustainable, you have to build public-private partnerships and get a broader community. So it's really exciting to see this happen. I do think there's something sustainable, and I'm uh, also delighted to see this follow-up meeting. I can't think of a better way to end this day on that optimistic <laughs> and inspiring note. I want to thank everybody who participated, my colleagues, Kerry Granis, Emily Parker, Brendan Macharik, and Peter Olson, and the Brookings Conference people who uh, make these things happen so well, the AV guys, and thank all of you for coming, and particularly the people who came from out of town to share their wisdom and insights with us.